Leviticus, and if you're a visitor today, you might say, why? <laughs> I'll also remind you that uh, it has been said Leviticus is the cleanest book in the Bible. No doubt said it. <laughs> no one ever teaches on it. But it was the most important book in the life of the Israelite. And why was that? Because it taught them how to worship an almighty holy God. And they had yearned for that. They had looked for that. How do we do that? And this book actually teaches them how to do that. Now, I heard about cloven hoofs and, uh, and chewing the cud since I was probably five or six years old. My mother loved the Old Testament. She told me all the stories out of the Old Testament. And I learned a lot about Leviticus. I wasn't sure what she was talking about, but I learned a lot about it. And I also learned over my many hours of studying this week that I had a lot of wrong conceptions about the book of Leviticus. So maybe you'll learn something today. I hope you will. Make it worth your while. And maybe you'll say, well, I don't agree with that. I'm going to go back and check that out. That's even better yet. But uh, we're going to get started here quickly because if you looked ahead, there are 47 verses in this chapter. Now, if I just read the 47 verses, it'd take a quarter of our time. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something different today. In fact, I don't remember ever doing it before this way. But I asked the Lord, how can I get through this book in 45 minutes? And he said, you can. So I'm going to do it in a commentary way. In other words, rather than read the verses, I'm going to tell you what's in those verses in a commentary way. And that way, uh, hopefully you'll get the whole story of Leviticus chapter 11, which is a very challenging chapter. It's not repetitious like a lot of the other chapters have been because it moves about different things, but there's a whole lot there. So you pray for me as I attempt to get through this. I can tell you that most of the commentary I took from Gordon Winham, who is the utmost authority on the book of Leviticus. He also is probably the utmost authority on all the book of the law. So I've enjoyed his commentary very much. It's a very large book and uh, I've had to cut this thing two or three times just to get it down to hopefully 45 minutes. All right, here is kind of a summary of the verses, and then I'll get into the commentary. It has to do with clean and unclean animals. That's the primary uh, source of this chapter. In verses 1 through 8, it has to do with the land creatures, edible, inedible, and unclean. Verses 9 through 12, Water creatures, edible, inedible, and detestable. Verses 13 through 23, flying creatures, inedible, detestable birds. And insects, detestable, edible, and detestable. So chapter, verses 24 through 47 has to do with pollution by animals and its treatment or cure. Leviticus 11 is dealing with the subject of cleanness and uncleanness, specifically with the subject of clean and unclean foods. The word clean has a lot of different meanings today, depending on the context and what is used. For example, in the operating room, things must be clean. They must be very clean. And that has a very rigid, strict interpretation to be as free as possible from germs and contamination. In an electronics plant, it needs to even be cleaner. Silicon crystals are grown and the clean room it is incredibly clean. There's hardly any contamination at all. And of course, restaurants, when you and I eat, are supposed to be clean, especially the kitchens. It's not always true. I remember someone telling me a story about going into a restaurant. Uh, this guy was on a date with uh, girlfriend and as they sat down he noticed a cockroach crawling up behind the chair she was sitting on 
And he thought, do I tell her about this or do I just keep silent and hope it goes away? Well, he kept silent and it did go away. But when he got up to the cash register, he said to the, cash, the cashier, he said, uh, you have a roach problem in this place. He said, there was a roach, a very big roach, climbing up a booth that we were sitting in. And he said, that's nothing. You should see the ones in the kitchen. <laughs> So clean and unclean means different things. In a third world country, clean means free of large clumps of contamination. In our children's bedrooms, in our grandchildren's bedrooms, clean has a definition that means everything is thrown into a pot, somewhere in the middle of the room, the side of the room, whatever it is. So clean means something different when we come to the definition of clean and unclean in Leviticus. And it's important for us to understand the meaning of clean and unclean is used in the Old Testament and its application in the New Testament. In fact, all scripture we should think about, what did it mean to the people that it was written to originally and how does that have application to us today? And we're gonna do that as we move along. For one thing, the expression clean and its counterpart unclean is one of the prominent themes of Leviticus. And the author I talked about, Winham, he says this, that unclean and its cognates occurs 132 times in the Old Testament. Over 50% of those are in Leviticus. So the sense of uncleanness is a predominant theme and the word clean, along with its related terms, occurs 74 times in Leviticus, which is over one third of the uses found in the entire Old Testament. All of that must have some kind of grasp over what clean and unclean is and how the words apply to the Israelites in that day. Now when we leave the Old Testament and come to the New Testament, we once again find the definition of clean and unclean is critical to our understanding. We find these issues discussed and debated heatedly between the scribes and the Pharisees and our Lord had to do with cleanliness and uncleanliness. Particularly the area of ceremonial uncleanliness as defined by Jewish tradition. Not so much as defined by Old Testament revelation. If we're going to understand how our Lord differed from the scribes and the Pharisees, if we're going to understand how Judaism went to seed on the area of clean and unclean, we must first understand the backdrop teachings of cleanness and uncleanness as it is introduced to us in this particular chapter. We must also observe that cleanness and uncleanness is related to holiness. Certainly this is so in Leviticus, and if that is so, then you and I are committed to the concept of holiness in general and to the reality of holiness in specific to our lives. Then we must understand the role that cleanliness plays in regard to holiness. All this says to us that these chapters are important. We must understand that we're dealing with as we come to our study because clean and unclean is one of the great issues of the Bible. And we should note that clean and unclean was a great issue dividing Jews and Gentiles. Clean and unclean was the critical issue that had to be met head on and solved in Acts chapter 10 and 11 before the church could become a church. There was the dividing between the Jews and the Gentiles. When we come to Leviticus 11, we come to, a, to a, the third major section in Leviticus, chapters 1 through 7. If you remember, had the offerings and the sacrifice the Israelites could bring. Chapters 8 through 10, which we just uh, have been through, dealt with the priesthood. And the actual ordination of Aaron and his sons, which culminated, as we know, in the death of his two oldest sons, and the instructions which came to Israel to us from that. There were the offerings, the priesthood, now chapters 11 through 15 deal with those things which are clean and unclean. Chapter 11 begins by talking about clean and unclean food. And the matters of uncleanness is related I believe to Leviticus 10.10, 10, you remember this from last week, where it is commanded that the priests are not to drink wine or strong drink as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane 
and the clean and the unclean. In other words, if he's going to have a clear mind, he must have a sober mind. Therefore, he's not to drink when he's discerning. Now, I can tell you that discernment of the Bible is one of the most important things. And we've heard people teach and preach that we thought, wow, what discernment they have. How deep they could go into the Bible. They're telling me stuff I've read many times I've never thought about. That has to do with discernment, knowing the difference. Now, this distinction between holy and the profane and the clean and the unclean, this matter of declaring something clean and unclean, was a matter strictly for the priest, and they needed full comprehension to do it. Also, we notice in Leviticus 16, which is a chapter dealing with the Day of Atonement, that the purpose of the annual atonement was to make the people of Israel clean. Cleanness and uncleanness was a preparatory issue that comes to declare the people of God unclean and therefore in that great need of atonement as described in Leviticus 16. Now we're going to take a brief look at the details here in chapter 11 and let me preface this by giving one word of caution that when we come to the animals named here some of us agonize over not being able to pronounce them correctly, let alone understand what and who they are. One of the scholars, obviously Winham, has pointed out that likely in no more than 40% of the creatures named here can they be absolutely confident that they have the right name, let alone the right one. So therefore, all the animals is not named in giving out these instructions. They give a category of animals, and there's tons of other animals that can fit into that category. So they're not all named. So we don't need to get hung up on what this particular animal or that particular animal is. All the animals here are just examples of the many animals, but they need to comply with God. what God says is clean and unclean. And it doesn't really matter anyway today, but. We need to know that. Essentially, it is easy to at least discern, discern what we are dealing with, three different categories of creatures. When we come to chapter 11, we first come to the land creatures, the animals that roam about the earth, verses 1 to 8. Then we find in verses 9 through 12, the water creatures, those that live under the water and in the water. And finally, we have the flying creatures. So we have the same three basic distinctions found back in Genesis 1, where God created all life that is in the heavens, in the earth, and under the waters. Those three categories all dealt with, and creatures that are in those categories are to define as being either clean or unclean, according to the formula that God lays down. Now in verses 24 through 47, the last half of the book, deal with the cure and the solution of the problem of uncleanness. Now, generally speaking, one of the prominent themes of those last chapters has to do with death. That is, whether it is a clean animal that is corrupted or made unclean by its death, because all dead creatures are unclean, or whether it is an unclean animal that has been perhaps killed in order to be eaten. It is in its death that the animal contaminates. If we are going to eat a creature, the first thing we generally do is kill them. The death of any creature contaminates it and makes it unclean. There is only one way in which an animal can be killed in order for it to be clean, and that is to offer it as a sacrifice. Leviticus 17 clearly spells that out. Essentially, we are dealing with misdemeanor offenses in this chapter. These are not felony type offenses because usually one is only unclean until the evening. And the only thing they have to do to become clean again when they're contaminated is to wash with water. Now if a clay pot also was defiled, it could be cleansed, then it could be destroyed. But normally the solution was to wash it with water and in the evening it would be cleansed. Now we're going to go through the categories of cleanness and uncleanness as they're defined by God in these verses. And we notice in verse 1 that God spoke again to Moses and Aaron saying to them, 
I think this is significant because God normally would have spoken through Moses. Remember in the last chapter, he actually spoke directly to Aaron, and I said that's the only place he spoke directly to her, and what I meant was without including Moses. He was speaking, speaking directly to Aaron. He was actually proclaiming, well, you're now the high priest, so therefore I can speak directly to you. Now he's installed and come into his own, and he plays a leadership role here, and the priestly function is to declare things that are clean and unclean. Let's get to the land animals. There are two basic stipulations which must be met before an animal that dwells on the land can be considered clean and therefore can be eaten by an Israelite. It must be split hoofed, and some versions say cloven. I never understood what cloven was, but I guess it's split the same. And it must be a cub chewer. It cannot be just one of those, it must be both. So a non cut chewer split hover isn't good enough. It has to be both. And the text makes it very clear that it must be both. My mom, when she was teaching this to me, and I shake my head and I try to think in my head, does that animal I'm eating have split hooves, or is it not have split hooves? Does it chew the cud? You know, I, I get all mixed up. But for example, a, a rabbit, for example, is called a cud chewer. I understand that rabbits do not chew their cud like a cow does. So if you watch a rabbit eat, you'd observe that a rabbit ate his food and chewed it up very carefully. So it doesn't mean you have to have two stomachs and regurgitate your food. It just means you need to chew a lot, like our moms used to tell us to do, chew your food good, because it digests better whenever you food, chew it up very carefully. Now, Tony and I used to have dogs. We don't have any more, but we had big dogs. Uh, we had two German Shepherds, the last two dogs that we had. And uh, we know that dogs are not cut chewers, but when we would put food in their dish, they would not chew it, they inhaled it. <laughs> if you have, I don't know if little dogs do that, big dogs do. In fact, they'd race each other to the bottom because the one that had food left, the other dog would move over and try to take some of that food. So, one animal is so fearful, the other animal is going to get his food. They just inhale it. They don't chew the cud. But when we look at a rabbit, we see a rabbit sort of works on his food and works on his food. So he's a cud chewer. Does not technically have to be cow-like. So cud chewers are what? They're vegetarians, <coughs> as a general rule. It has to be split up in cud chewing if it is clean, and therefore the Israelite may partake in it. We've seen and heard comparisons about uh, ruminating like a cow, referring to meditation and things like that. You know, we get the food of the word, we regurgitate it, we meditate upon it. I've seen those examples made a lot. I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one, but we've all heard them. Now we get to the sea creatures. When we come to the creatures that dwell in the sea, they must meet two qualifications as well. They must have fins and scales. Now that is certainly the norm. Those of you that are fishermen hope to catch something when you throw in your line and expect it to have fins and scales, right? It must have both of those in order to qualify. That would mean that creatures that live in the sea like shrimp, lobster, and those kind of creatures would not fit. Only those that have fins and scales, only those that are fishy would be clean. Third, those creatures that are in the air. It seems as though essentially no qualification, qualifications are given. That is, it doesn't have to have two wings, although I've seen birds try to fly with one and it doesn't work very well. But rather, it seems as though those creatures in the air are creatures that are non vulture like That is, they are not sitting around waiting for something to die so they can go pick it up and eat it. Then we have flying insects that are described. Here, all flying insects are called unclean. 
with the exception of those that have a set of jumper legs, which would propel them so they can leap through the air and thus propel themselves in the air, jumping, flying insects are edible, to my dismay. All the rest are not. Remember John the Baptist, what did he eat? Wild locusts and I. I always wondered not how he could eat them, but how he could catch them. I mean, those things, they, they, they jump way up in the air, and you go near one, they're gone. But somehow he's, he figured that out. Fourth, there is a category of dead animals which are unclean. Essentially, any dead animal other than an animal which has been killed through the sacrificial process in the door, and also in the front door of the tent of meeting are unclean. There are unclean animals that will defile, defile in their death, and there are clean animals that will defile man in their death if their death is not a sacrificial death. The carcasses that are that which can contaminate, therefore if a person eats a cow which has just been killed by a wolf, a person would be ceremonially unclean even though they could eat the meat if it were sacrificed to God. Now we get to a very interesting one, the swarming animals. These are kind of a bit of a puzzle, but this category includes things like mice, lizards, and most all those things that I can pass up, I don't know about you, so I can easily and readily identify them. I don't know how many of you saw the movie uh, Cry Wolf. I saw it twice because I'm a wolf lover. And I enjoyed the movie immensely, except uh, when I watched this intently, the scene where the fellow eats the mice. I don't know if you saw the movie, but uh, see, he studied the wolves, and he can't understand what they live on during the winter, when the things that normally feed on are gone. Then all of a sudden, one day, hordes of mice appear all over, and the man must decide how the wolves could live on the protein of mice. So he cooks up a batch of mouse stew. <laughs> I remember when he popped that first mouthful and crunched the bones, I say to myself, oh, <laughs> unclean. <laughs> I agree with that, and I understand. But apparently they are called swarming because they go about in groups, and they seem to have erratic, unpredictable manner of movement. You ever tried to catch a mouse? They just move all over the place. You almost have to corner them in order to catch them. Okay, now a general definition of cleanness and uncleanness. Let's talk about cleanness and uncleanness just in terms of generalities. What are some things we can observe uh, cleanness and uncleanness as we find in Leviticus 11? Other points we will get different kinds of uncleanness, but let me touch on a few characteristics of cleanliness and uncleanliness. First of all, in chapter 11, cleanness and uncleanness has to do principally with food. It deals secondarily with cleanness and uncleanness as a result of contact with a dead animal. Even a clean animal, a bull or a sheep, could not be eaten if it were not killed in a sacrificially prescribed way. So it has to do with food or that which is touched when dead. If you remember when we were going through the sacrificial system, these animals were killed and many of these animals, they brought their families into the outer part of the temple and they enjoyed eating all that food because it was legal, because it was sacrificed food. Second, cleanness and uncleanness is a matter of category rather than a condition. When we talk about being clean, we generally speak of the condition of someone is in. If our children are unclean, they need to have their hands washed, but they're still in the category of a child. Let's say when we look on the internet, we find maybe a car that we want to buy, and it says it is clean. It's talking about the condition of that car, not the classification. It can be any kind of a car. It's clean. These are categories. Clean in automobile terms is a condition, but again, we're dealing with categories. Clean is a categorical pronouncement. It is all those land animals that chew the gut, have split hooves, whether their hooves have been washed or not, 
the category clean or the category is unclean depending upon the classification of that particular creature. Third, cleanness is that which is defined by God and declared by the priest. Clean or unclean is clean and unclean by the definition, and the definition for the clean and unclean creatures are given to us here. It is declared by the priest, which will become more and more important as we get into the next few chapters, which has to do with skin disorders. It is the priest who must say it's clean or unclean. Fourth, it is the state of access to God. The practical outworking of being declared unclean means that we must stay back. For example, a priest in Leviticus 22 could not go about his priestly duties in a state of uncleanness. He must wait until he is ceremonially clean. So we may not approach God in his normal worship in an unclean state. It restricts one's fellowship with God. And it restricts one's fellowship with men. That is the natural consequence of the declaration of uncleanness. Let me give you an example. If a preacher or a teacher comes into the pulpit or before the people and starts teaching without having been prayed up and having been put humble before his creator, he's unclean. If we come to the Lord's table without confessing our sins before we come to the table, then we are unclean and we should not partake of the table. So cleanness is somehow related to holiness. We say that cleanliness is next to godliness. You ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the Bible, but that's what we say. It's not a bad example. It's not really not spiritual. But in Leviticus, cleanliness is next to holiness. When we get down to the basic reason why an Israelite is to make these distinctions, between clean and unclean, it is because God says, you are to be holy for I am holy. For the first time in history, for the first time in the Old Testament, men and women are to observe these distinctions because God has made them. Therefore, cleanliness is related to God's holiness. And Israel is to observe it because of the holiness of God. Twice it's repeated in this chapter, therefore, there is a direct relationship between what is clean and what is holy in Scripture. What is clean, unclean, can never be holy. Some things that are clean can be concentrated, consecrated and set apart as holy, but nothing which is holy is unclean. Only that which is clean can be holy. I know that's a little bit confusing, but it's true. There is also the intensification of this process that goes on. When we read through chapter 11, we start out with a sense that these are the creatures that are going about on the land, and some of them are clean, some are unclean. The clean ones they could eat, and the unclean ones were to avoid. But that by the time we get to the category of those that are in the water, it talks about them being detestable or abhorrent. And their carcasses you shall detest. They're not just unclean, you don't eat them. You need to detest them. Their ascension once emotions must come into agreement with God's emotions. One of the stories I read years ago called The Dog Eater. This was when I was a little guy. And this poor old man was a trapper and he was stuck in the middle of winter in a cabin with no food. He and his dog were together and as the man neared the condition of starvation, he began to have these terrible dreams that he did not want to dream, but they kept coming up. It was a dream of having dog tail of the soup. Finally, the day came when the man crept up behind the dog, lopped off his tail, and boiled it for soup. A few days later, the dog came back, I'm sure he loved for quite a while, with a stump of the tail, and the man shared his soup with the dog, who seemed to think it was all right to eat it. I can't think of anything more detestable than to eat dog tail soup. <laughs> there is, in a sense, which the Israelite is called to detest that which is unclean. It is not enough for the Israelite to say, I can't eat this, and I can't eat that. It's more a matter of saying that I loathe these things. You know, when Eve looked at the forbidden fruit, it looked good to eat. She looked at that as something desirable, not just to look at. 
but something desirable to eat. God knows that if we look upon something as desirable, sooner or later we're going to eat it. It's only when we look at that as something terribly undesirable that we're not going to eat it. Oh, he said this, and I know it's not a very good thing to say, but if you want to lose weight, don't go on a diet, eat bad food. <laughs> You're not going to eat much of it. But you know, eat, eating good food is one of the pleasures of life, so I probably won't be doing that. <laughs> Better yet, if I could start looking at donuts as not only something I can't eat, but I'm looking at them as fat pills. I can't eat them. I have to start looking at them as the worst thing in the world. Amen. And that is what an Israelite was called to do with regard to unclean animals. It was to be detestable to them so that they didn't have the indication or inclination of wanting to eat them. I find it interesting that Jews today, one of the things they have kept, because in Israel, I'd say 80, 90% of the Jews are not believing in God, believing in Jesus, but they keep two things. They keep the holidays and they keep the diet. It's interesting, isn't it? Even though they're not believing in God today. God never tells Israel why something is clean or unclean. He never gives them a reason for the definition for clean or unclean. For centuries, men have tried to give reasons for these definitions of clean and unclean. And Winham's commentary outlines four, which I think are worthy of mentioning, which is one kind of food clean and another kind unclean. Here they are. The first is the cultic explanation. It says certain kind of creatures were used in pagan worship and were sacrificed. Now, they sacrificed pigs, they sacrificed all kinds of animals, but they also sacrificed clean animals. So that's a difficult one to say this is why God did this because actually cows was something they sacrificed and bulls. The second reason, and this is the one I've always ascribed to growing up, and that was for hygienic reasons. In other words, health reasons. This is the one most Christians love so much today. The basic theory is found in a number of books, one of them which is None of these diseases. The basic theory is that God prohibited the eating of certain animals because it was unhealthy to eat those in those days. They didn't have refrigerators and microwaves like all those things that kill germs. Now that sounds like a reasonable thing and I would go so far as to say that there may be some creatures that God called unclean that were not health, unhealthy, but that were not healthy to eat. And that's true. But that distinction doesn't hold water because you get to the New Testament and the Lord declared all things to be clean. There were no refrigerators. There were no microwaves. It was the same kind of earth. So that one, I'm kind of moving away from now, even though I've lived in that one. I even saw one commentary, and this was interesting, how this commentary guy he laid out the fact that Jews live longer than Gentiles in all generations. And they've been healthier than Gentiles in all generations. But he gave no collaboration evidence to it. So I looked for it, and I couldn't find it. So I kind of threw that one out. The third view, is, when Ham suggests, is the symbolic interpretation. In other words, in those things man eats or does not eat, he is an imitator of God. What do I mean by that? That is, there are only certain things which God allows to be offered up as a burnt offering to him. Interestingly, the sacrificial terminology is used, but is offered up as food to God. That's what he says there. Now, obviously, God doesn't eat food, but is the symbolism employed? So if God is selective about what he eats, that is, what is sacrificed to him, the Israelites ought to be choosy about what they eat. It seems to be partly true, if not universally true, that many of the creatures that are unclean are those which may live on meat and may therefore be blood shedders. For instance, in the category of those animals, 
which prowl on the face of the earth. The cat family is an illustration that does not have split hoofs, it has paws. Neither does those have does it have those kind of teeth like a cow that are for chewing up like rats. They have claws. They have sharp teeth because they kill other animals. They shed blood in order to eat. Now, we were cat people at one time, too. In fact, we had dogs and cats at the same time. And they kind of got along, you know, when they grow up together, they do. But we had cats in places that didn't have, you know, all these animals that kill them that do today. So we let our cats go outside. And sometimes you'd hear this muffled kind of meow outside the door. You'd open up the door and that cat would have a big mouse or a big bird or something in his mouth. And he was like, let me in. I want to keep this in a clean place. <laughs> well, they finally got used to us shooing them away when they had that bird or rat in their mouth. And the next time when I opened the door, they'd come running at the door before I could catch them. It would seem that often, though not always, the animals that are unclean are bloodshedders. Are those that eat off of dead prey as vultures and some other sort of animal. So there is some similarity between what Israelites are to eat. They are not to eat animals that of themselves sacrifice of life or come into contact with other animals. So man only eats creatures which are themselves free from contamination by death and not by shedding up blood in a sacrificial way. Here's the one I finally landed on that I think is the right answer to this. Fourth answer is called the arbitrary definition. Why did God call the pig unclean and the cow clean? God never explains this by looking at all the commentaries I did. We find that nobody has figured it out either. It may be that there isn't any reason at all, except that God said clean and unclean. Think about God's choice of Israel as a nation. Is there some reason why God chose Israel as opposed to the Canaanites? Did he choose the Israelites because they were so spiritually pure? They were not. The prophets would remind Israel that they served foreign gods when they were in Egypt, and they brought those foreign gods with them when they came out of Egypt. Was it because they were powerful and numerous and looked promising and God wanted to go with a winning team? No. They were nobody. So why did God choose Israel versus some other nation? Well, it seems that it was arbitrary. Now, it doesn't really explain everything about that, but let me ask you another question. Why did God choose Jacob versus Esau. Doesn't say. But it says he loved Jacob and hated Esau. Election is the point we see in the clean and the unclean, as well as in the salvation of Israel. And I always come back to the question, why did God choose me? Why did he choose you? Now, let's look at cleanness and uncleanness in the Old Testament from a broader brush view. If we look at the words cleanness and uncleanness, we would discover that clean and unclean are only found in Genesis 7 and 8 with Noah. And it was only found with respect to those animals that were brought into the ark. Remember, they brought seven of the clean animals and they only brought two of the unclean animals. Why did they bring seven of the clean animals? Sacrifice. Exactly right. They offered up the clean as a sacrifice. The distinction between clean and unclean is as much older than Moses' day. It goes clear back to Noah's day. And Noah didn't say to God, clean, unclean, what are you talking about? Noah knew what a clean creature was and he knew what an unclean creature was. And he brought seven of the clean ones so that he could sacrifice them. So how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Well, let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they went out of fellowship with God? He couldn't come and walk with them anymore. What did he do? He killed an animal, he sacrificed an animal, 
and clothed them with the skins. So therefore, I'm sure he sat down with Adam and Eve and says, here are the animals you can eat and here are the animals you cannot eat. And they handed it down to the next generation and actually, until they got to Noah. So Noah knew all about what was clean and unclean. By the way, so did Cain and Abel. Noah already understood that anything that was to, to be offered to God had to be something that was clean. However, it was not until Leviticus 4 that the clean and unclean terminology reappears after Genesis 7 and 8. But now it's given a lot more substance. Clean and unclean are brought to bear on Israel's worship of God and on Israel's eating habits. So there's a history of clean and unclean that goes back further even beyond Moses. Cures for uncleanness are spelled out in Leviticus and through the Old Testament in particular, what, it, what was interesting is that we moved toward the end of the New Testament, our Old Testament, in that period of the prophets, we discovered the prophets began to talk about cleanliness and uncleanness as something internal rather than merely external. Before something unclean was something out there, or it was out here if it was a, something that grew on the skin. It was not something apart. Psalms 19, 19 says the fear of the Lord is clean. In Psalms 51, 10, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Now, cleanliness is something more internal than external. Ultimately, God says that he's going to make the Israelites clean, something that never was possible in the Old Testament under their legal system. He was going to make them plain, clean, but he was going to also give them a new covenant and a coming Messiah. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27 spells this out. It says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new heart within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Even in Old Testament times, the prophets were pointing forward and saying, ultimate cleanness can only come by the work of God himself. It can only come when the internal part of man is transformed, when he is cleansed, when he has a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. In other words, clean, cleanness can only come ultimately through the new covenant and through the coming of Jesus Christ, whose blood cleanses us from all sins. And the prophets certainly look forward to that. When we come to the New Testament, we discover immediately that our Lord be, begins to turn, uh, talk in terms of clean and unclean. And particularly as the scribes and Pharisees are disputing with them in Mark 7. For example, they debate about whether Jesus and his disciples can come in from outside and begin to eat dinner. And they not ceremonially wash their hands. This has nothing to do with their hands being dirty. They were supposed to ceremonially wash their hands. And by the way, this is something the Jews added to the interpretation and the meaning of the Old Testament is not there. They had more emphasis on cleanliness that was their tradition by scripture and not according to the scripture. The Old Testament says, don't you understand what Jesus says, that it is not that which comes from without that defiles a man, but that which comes from within that defiles a man. Then Mark says parenthetically, thus he declared all things to be clean. No one really understood the implications until after the death of Jesus. Cleanness and uncleanness in terms of food was what distinguished a Jew and a Gentile. That is, a Jew, in order to eat of the kinds of foods God prohibited, could not eat in a Gentile home because undoubtedly there was going to be contamination there. That built up a great wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. That distinct, distinction was designed in the Old Testament to keep them set apart, but it had to be set aside in the New Testament. The book of Ephesians says, the middle wall of partition has been torn down. The enmity that existed there has been taken away and the Jews and Gentiles have been brought together in one body, the church. 
The distinctions, therefore, that separate Jews and Gentiles were set aside. In Acts chapter 10, God said it in a vision to Peter, you remember? When all of these, the sheep came down and they, there was all these four-footed beasts, clean and unclean, take and eat. He said, God, I've never done this. I can't do that. And Jesus said, God said, what I say is clean, is clean. It's okay now. And that was, again, was an arbitrary decision. God said something is clean or unclean, that makes it so. And then, of course, later on, Peter went to the house of Cornelius and ate his ham sandwich or whatever they had and shares the gospel with him. And guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles just as it did the Jews at the day of Pentecost. I'm going to skip a couple of things because my time is running out. You remember the time when Peter is sitting with the Jews and Paul is with the Gentiles? And Peter is saying that you have to become a Jew in order to become a child of God. And Paul, he gets all over it for that because he obviously had it wrong. In the New Testament, Colossians 2, which says these practices which have to do with external things have no value in overcoming the struggle with the flesh. So what does it say to a New Testament saint? We're going to wrap this up. When we're looking at the change of God's law with regard to a kind of food, it is often a signal that we're dealing with a change of time or a change of dispensations. There are distinctive distinctions when the way God has dealt with men. What happens in Genesis 1 when God creates all those creatures and he makes man his own image in the last of that chapter? God said, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree that has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. So in the beginning, they were all vegetarians. And so were the animals. There was no meat eating meat. People eating meat or animals eating each other after the sacrifices made by Noah of the clean animals, then God blessed Noah. And in Genesis 9, 3, he says, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give it, I give it you all of the green plant, and you shall not eat flesh, he made this exception, of its life, that is its blood. So therefore, that was the only exception to eating meat, and you needed to drain the blood. Okay, my time is up. I'm going to come to the conclusion. Final, final. You know, one thing that I love, even though you really need to study the Bible to understand it, and some parts of it are a lot harder than others. Certainly, Leviticus is probably harder than other books. But when it comes to our relationship with God, and it comes to the issue of where we will spend eternity, it's clear cut. It's simple. All of those who are in Christ are saved and their sins are forgiven. It's a category. All of those who are trusting in anything else, good works or whatever, are not in Christ. In that sense, our salvation is a clear-cut yes or no, in and out matter. God made it simple. So human, the least of all people, could understand it. All of those who trust in anything else are out. It's a clean issue. We're either in Christ or we are not. God bless you for being here. And uh, we will continue, God willing, next week in Leviticus chapter 12.